First Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Tonight I want to talk about the one thing that, it, that everything else is bottomed on and foundationed on. And that's the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Great is the mystery of godliness. Nobody can understand it. I wish some of us could believe it. God, God was manifest in the flesh. Don't you wish you could believe the word? You know anybody that believes God's book? I'm not fussing at you. Somebody's going to pick up the Bible some of these days and just believe it. Don't just make the rest of us so ashamed of ourselves. Thank God. God was manifest in the flesh. I wasn't present when a little babe was born in Bethlehem stable. But the Holy Spirit was, and he calls a record of that birth to be given in this book. God help you to believe what the Spirit said. Wish I could. The greatest, most stupendous thing you'll ever be called upon the face is this statement that Jesus Christ is actually God and he is God come down so you and I could touch him and feel him and hear him and understand him and be joined to him. Came down as a man. I wish somebody believed that. Whether you believe it or not, it's so. And if you go to hell, nobody to blame but you. Anybody that lives from Adam until the last man in rebellion and in lawlessness without a heart that beats with the love of God. Any man that does that ought to be sent to hell. Any man that will not give himself to love and obey and serve God who didn't leave us alone but came down here in a form we could understand. And if you go to hell, I know one person that you can't blame. It's not God. You know, I'm prejudiced in favor of the Bible. I try to believe it. There's some of it I think I've been able to enter into. I've heard the expression, I believe the Bible from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, so and so, but that's usually by a person that never has uh, examined what's in between. I don't know whether we believe the Bible or not. You know, we're living in a day where everybody's a Christian. It's a good question as anybody. You know anybody say? You know anybody believes the Bible? Do you? That's not a silly question. Not a silly question. But I'm prejudiced in favor of the Bible. 
I understand that the Bible tells me that God visited this earth. That when you walk out of this little tabernacle and touch that ground, you'll touch ground that a little portion of the blood of God's Son has punctured. For his blood was shed and some of it dripped down on Palestine soil and the uh, rages of time have washed every grain of dirt in this old world. It's stained, it's colored by the life blood of God himself. You can't even walk on the ground, on ground, that hadn't been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. I hope the Bible tells me the truth. I understand that the blood of Christ stands for his giving himself, laying down his life, pouring out his soul unto death to satisfy God and to set sinners free. I can't prove that to anybody, but I sure hope it's so. And I'm not here for these services to try to prove to anybody anything. I'm not your God. You don't have to answer to me. I had nothing to do with your birth, and I'll have, to have nothing to do with your death. If you want to live down here in this world a little while, you didn't have anything to do with coming into it. You'll not have a thing to say about leaving. If you want to live down here and ignore the greatest fact of history, the fact that God came down here and died. you that big a fool. I guess although it'll break your mother's heart, you'll just have to go to hell. If you're such a fool that you live all the days of your life and never face up to the implications of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't think there's any hope for you. And I think if you don't face up that, that you're the biggest fool out of here. And yet I can't prove to you that Jesus laid down his life for sinners. But I can believe this book. I was not present in the council chambers of the triune God. And I was not present when Jesus Christ was constituted a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But the Holy Spirit was. And the Holy Spirit has caused the record of that transaction to be placed in this blessed book. And I don't know, you don't have to believe it if you don't want to. God knows I want to believe. I want to believe it's actually so. That there never has been a second of time when Jesus wasn't the slain, crucified Son of God. That from the time of Adam to the last man, there's never been a time on this earth when men and women didn't hear the message to look to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I wasn't present when God determined that his son should be crucified in his mind and thus a willing and able Savior for every believer but from the poor, the foundation of the world. But the Holy Spirit was, and the record of it's in this book. And you can ignore this book if you want to. And you can plead your ignorance if you want to. And you can make a profession of faith if you want to. And you can go through some motions if you want to. But God bless your heart. There's one thing you better find out to your own satisfaction, whether or not you're willing to risk your soul's eternal welfare on the testimony of this book about what happened in the councils of God. I tell you what's the fact I'm so glad this book tells me about the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, coming down here to live under God's law and to die under the lash of God's law. I have faced the fact that if this book is so, and I'm not going to try to prove this to you, if this book is so, if I ever spend eternity 
in the presence of God. I've got to be as holy as God. God will not take anybody that isn't as holy as he is in the eternal glory. And I can't make myself holy. I praise God for the book that tells me about being sanctified, made holy by the once for all offering of Jesus Christ. So that as I stand before you now, I don't care whether you believe this or not, I do, and it sure does tickle me. I'm just as righteous as Christ, and I'm just as holy as God in the sight of God. And the reason I am is the blood been applied to me. The reason I am is that the blood has, has availed for me. I praise God for it. I praise God for it. Oh, my soul, thank the Lord, Jesus Christ has died. That's the most stupendous fact I ever seen. Now, I can preach you a pretty good sermon and prove to you that he died for sinners. I don't have any trouble believing that. But I'll tell you something that I, I, I tell you I, I'm going to believe it. I'm just going to believe it just because I can't prove it. It's too high for me. I don't have any trouble taking the Scripture and understanding that he died in my stead. What bothers me is that he died at all. I didn't understand him dying for sinners. But you come tell me how God could die. It says God was manifest in the flesh. It said he is a man, but he is God too. It is God who is manifest in the flesh. That is God's blood that oozed out of his veins. God bless your heart, brother Don. I can't understand how God could die. How me like the stars would have run together when the one who created them hung on a cross and gave up the ghost. The greatest mystery and the greatest fact of the universe is that God died. God died. God died. I wish I could believe that. Sometimes as I've gone up and down this country, all over the country for 30 odd years, I get so tired of looking people in the face that seem determined they're not going to believe God's word. They think the preacher is some sort of magician trying to sell them a bill of goods. Honey, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace, and if you want to go to hell, I guess there's nobody on God's earth can stop you from doing it. And I know God Almighty is not going to stop you unless he can bring you to faith in his son. But I tell you one thing, sometimes I like to preach whether anybody believes it or not and just rejoice that Jesus died, Jesus died, Jesus died. My only hope, my only plea, Christ Jesus died and he died for me. Praise the Lord. I thank God this book promises that he died. <laughs> All through this book, old Abraham, he heard the gospel about the one who come, God manifests in the flesh and preached to him. And he didn't have more sense than to believe it and act upon it. And says it just tickled him to death. Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. And I read about a fellow named Moses. The gospel was preached to him. And he thought it tickled him. And then there's a poor old harlot woman named Rahab. The gospel is preached to her. And she was a Gentile, and she got in on the line just because she didn't have more sense than like a little child just to believe the unbelievable and rejoice in the unexplainable that God would come and die in the stead of sinners. I thank God. That when we pick up this book, and I sure do hope this is God's word, I'm prejudiced in its favor. I tell you, it tells me about the Lord. It tells me about the Lord. It tells me about the Lord. No other book does. I'm prejudiced in its favor. I preach my own father's funeral. I, 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 I hope this is so. This book tells me that my father... He is not like a dead dog out yonder in the cemetery in Gunnersville, Alabama, 
But this book tells me that my father's with the Lord, and one day he's going to have a body just like the Lord, and one day I'll see him again. I can't prove that to anybody, but I hope it's so. Last summer we went to California, and coming back we drove several hundred miles out of the way to go to Denton, Texas, and the first time in 27 years. I knelt by the graveside of my firstborn child. I hadn't been back to a grave in 27 years. It is in August, and it was awfully hot. And my wife, she'd been back once since then. And as the August sun came in that te Texas climate, my wife prostrated herself 27 years, and still just, just touch her, and she'd bleed for longing for her firstborn child. Oh, my soul, as we knelt there on each side of that grave last summer, first time for me in 27 years, I recall when we went out from the little, from the tabernacle where another preacher had preached the funeral of my firstborn child. And we followed that hearse out yonder to the cemetery and they, they, they put that green sward on and the flowers on top it made us all go home. And that afternoon, the funeral's in the morning. That afternoon, wife and I slipped away. We were young. And our little girl was three and a half years old. And we went out to that graveside. And already the summer sun was causing the flowers to wither and wilt away. And we knelt on either side of the grave. And seemed like women always believed God mourn us old mean men. And she looked up through the stars of her tears and faced me and said, Rob, Patty Sue isn't here. She's with the Lord, and we'll see her again. No other book tells me about that. I sure hope this is God's book. If I was you, I'd buy me one, and I'd search it, and I'd read it till my eyes bugged out, and I'd read it and say, Oh, Lord, help me to believe it. Oh, thou Spirit of God that ignited it, burn it into my soul so that it'll be me for my old hungry bones. And when hell freezes it over, I can stand and say, bless God, this is his word. For time and eternity, God helps somebody to get out of this awful condition of claiming to be Christians these days and you never crack the lids of this blessed book. This is a bible generation of Christians. Our churches have to buy Bibles and put them in the Sunday school classes so they can count having a Bible in Sunday school. This is a generation of people who claim to be saved but don't believe the Bible. Oh, my friends, I'd buy me a Bible and I'd beg God to help me believe it. I'd beg God to write it in the marrow of my bones. I'd beg God to take it out of the realm of the theoretical and the hypothetical until I could believe it. And I could stand with old Martin Luther and say, this is his book and on it I stand. So help me God, I can do no other. I'm prejudiced in favor of the Bible. For the Bible tells me about the one who's promised to die in my stead. I was not a Christian when I had my college days. I was a church member. And I was not saved till after I'd been graduated from school. And I remember I had to take two courses in Bible in order to get a degree at that Baptist school. And I didn't pay any attention to them. I just listened to the professor enough so I could pass the courses. But after I got saved, many of the expressions of that dear old Bible teacher, uh, I found out they had found some lodgment. And one thing he used to say so many times that I just didn't pay much attention to, but it's meant so much to me ever since. He said, young men and women, if you want to know how to study this Bible and find the mind of God and remember that we'll be judged by this book, We'll not be judged by my opinion or your opinion or how you think of it or how I think of it. We'll be judged by the words of this book. He said, if you want to read it right and not go off at a tangent, not go off astray, not get all balled up and not make shipwreck of your faith. He said, you take an old Bible, you do not particularly care about keeping it nice 
and you take an awl of some kind and, and run a hole, tear through the Bible from cover to cover, and then you take a big needle and thread it with a ribbon or a crimson thread just so it's red, and you thread that needle through the Bible and then not the thread on either side. And then when you open that old Bible, every page you turn, you'll see red and you'll understand that the one thing that makes the world tick, the one thing that keeps the world going, the one hope of time, the one hope of eternity is in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that ribbon will help you see that every page has meaning in terms of the fact that God's Son would pour his life out as a ransom for sinners, as a satisfaction to a holy God to keep people out of hell. And that's right. All through this Bible, it is promised that the time would come when one would come and take up the note and set men free. I wasn't present when the Old Testament things took place. I wasn't present when old Abraham heard that story, but the Holy Spirit was, and he caused it to put down there. When I was a little child, a little boy, I was read in Sunday school, training union, church services, and I could memorize scripture to sight so much better than I can now. And I learned a lot about the Bible, and it used to trouble me. Did it ever trouble you? I didn't know much. I wondered why God waited till just 2,000 years ago to provide a Savior. And I found out he didn't. I found out that the Savior was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. I found out that old Abraham could look to one who would die for him and be saved just as much as I look to one who has died for him. I used to say, well, I, I couldn't understand it, brother. You see, I didn't understand it. And I said, well, did God just let all those millions and billions of people that live, didn't they have any opportunity to be saved? I thank God for this old book. This book tells me there'll be not a single sinner in hell who didn't have an opportunity to turn his eyes away from himself and cast all his hope on the one hanging on a cross. Oh, my soul, thank God the blood was promised. And then this book tells me that in due time to take up the note, God's Son came in the flesh, that God actually set feet here on this earth, that he walked in a little country called Palestine, and that he taught over that and that God made him subject to the law and that he kept it and pleased God and then that God laid sin upon him and he became guilty and he hung there under the lash and the curse of God's holy law and he shed his blood and poured out his life. You know, I wasn't present when Jesus hung on the cross, but the Holy Spirit was. And I believe with all of my heart, I think I do, God knows I want to, that the Holy Spirit guided the brains and the hands of some men, and they left the record of that holy hour when they led the eternal Son of God up to Golgotha's hill, laid him down on an old tree, crossed his hands, nailed a spike in him, putting both hands up above his head, and then crossed his feet and took an old spike and drove it through those two feet, shins down into the tree and then they lifted that tree up and with him hanging there nailed this way and with his feet crossed nailed that way they hung him and let him drop let the let the old tree drop into the ground 
in the noonday sun. He hung there. He hung there. He hung there. I wasn't present when that took place. I can't prove to you it did. But the Holy Spirit was. And I believe he left the record of it in this book. And that's the reason I repeat to you tonight, honey, you better get your Bible and you better cry over it and pray over it until it becomes real to you and you can stand and spit in the devil's face and say, this is the truth of God. I believe it. And I'm saved by it. This second hand Easy come, easy go. Stop! They call salvation now not worth a dime. Oh, my soul! Do you believe? And do you stake your soul's destiny on it? That God in the flesh hung on a cross to satisfy the claims of God's holy law and to set sinners free. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? God knows, don't tell me you accept it. Do you believe it? It'll do to live by, will it? It'll do to die by. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? It's either the craziest fool thing that everybody, anybody ever thought of, or it's the truth of God. It's the truth of God. I thank God for the power of that blood. Who given his life laying it down? This book says, He redeemed me. He went down the marketplace and he paid the penalty. And the penalty of sin is death. And he died. And brought me back. No wonder if you're a Christian, you can say, I love him. Because he first loved me. Because you're not Christian, you can't say that. But if you don't love Jesus with all your heart, you're not Christian, are you? And no such thing being Christian unless you love the Lord. Unless you love the Lord. Oh, I thank God for the power of that blood to reconcile me. That blood turned the throne of God from judgment to grace. Now God can show mercy to all who call upon him. I wasn't present when the Lord Jesus Christ went back to glory. He went back with his own blood. I don't know whether it's literal or not, and he offered his own blood. I wouldn't argue with you about it. But having obtained eternal redemption, he went back not without his own blood. Oh, boy. When he got back, God Almighty turned this whole world over to him. Every human being is in his hand. It's a tremendous question what you do with Jesus, but it isn't half as important as what he'll do with you. Because he's got the whole world in his hand. 
The Father has given all things into his keeping because he died. This world's his. You're his. By his blood he bought you. And this world's reconciled. God, in the death of Christ, something happened that God can look with favor on sinful men and women because of the blood of Christ. I wasn't present and offered it at the throne of heaven, but the Holy Spirit was. And he's caused a record of it to be put in this book, and that's the only record we've got of it. And if you don't believe that, there's no other thing you can believe. And you don't have to believe that, but it's in there. It's in there. Thank God, the blood of Jesus Christ has made it possible for the Father to deal with Ralph Barnard and save the ungodly. And for want of a better word, I thank God for the power of the blood. It purchased my reception in glory. My Lord's already gone up there. And the book of Hebrews said, He went as my forerunner. He went ahead of me. And there's a man in glory now. And he's there as the pledge that all who believe in him shall one day follow. And when the scripture tells us about that time when the king of glory went back and the psalm says, Lift up ye gates, the king of glory comes in. Old Ralph Barnard coming in too some of these days. Because of the blood, I'm going pleading the blood. I'm going because the power of the blood can stop hell's gates and open heaven's glory. Thank the Lord, the blood of Jesus Christ. Dr. A.J. Gordon was a man greatly used of God in other years. He's a shepherd of a church in Boston. One Saturday he's awfully tired and busy. He's in his study trying to get a sermon for Sunday. His head was aching and he was very tired and dull. He closed his Bible and went out to study and walked down Boston Commons, a big, big street there in Boston, and uh, just let the fresh air, breathe the fresh air, and clear up his brain. And uh, he saw a little boy in Sunday school coming toward him. And the little boy had a little cage, a little bird cage in his hand. And as they came abreast of each other, Dr. Gordon saw that he had several little field birds in the cage. They were locked in. And he said, son, what you got there? He said, I got some birds. He said, uh, what kind are they? Oh, he said, they're just old field birds. They're not any good. He said, what you going to do with them, son? He said, Oh, I'm going to play with them. And then when he gets to it, guess I feed them to the cats. And Dr. Gordon said he looked at those little old birds and they were just scared to death and just trying to disappear within themselves. They're locked in that cage and couldn't fly out and lost their freedom. And he said he felt so sorry for him. He said, son, sell me the birds. And the little boy said, preacher, you don't want them. They're not in account. They're just old field birds. And Dr. Gordon said, I know what they are, but said, I want to buy them. Well, he said, Preacher, they're not worth much. said, I, 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 I you, you don't want to buy them. He said, yes, I do. He said, he said, name your price. And his little boy said, well, sure enough, do you want to buy them? He said, yes, I do. Well, he said, I'll take two dollars for them and throw in the key. And the preacher pulled out two dollar bills and gave the little boy. And the little boy took the bird cage handed over and the preacher put his hand in the little ring and they parted 
Dr. Gordon said as he walked down, he'd see a little boy standing there looking at him, wondering what kind of fool he was. He said little old birds wouldn't let out of church. they just scared to death. And said he ducked in between two buildings, you know, sort of a little alley. And he took that little old uh, door to the cage and he opened it. And he began to say to the little birds, fly out, little birds, you're free now. But they were so scared they wouldn't fly. And he tapped his hands on the cage, said, fly out, little bird, fly, fly. And finally one little bird summoned up his nerve, and he edged post, and finally saw the door was open, and he flew out. And then all of them followed. And Dr. Gordon said, as they flew up in the sky, they began to sing. And I could hear the song they were singing, redeem, redeem, redeem. As they flew away, he went back to his study and the next Sunday morning. He told the story of those little birds. He told how as the cage was unlocked and the little birds were bitten to fly out, they did. And then they sang the song of the redeemed. One day they walked upon the expanse of God's universe. One called Satan, Beelzebub. In his hand, he had a giant cage. And in that cage, he had Adam's lost and ruined and fallen race. They were locked in the cords of their own sin. And they didn't have the key to get out of jail themselves. And there came across the path of Satan, one clothed in the garments of holiness, the eternal Son of God. And he said, Satan, what have you there? He said, I got a world of sinners. He said, what you going to do with them? He said, I'm going to play with them. And when I get through, I'll torment them in hell. And the Son of God said, Satan, sell them to me. And Satan said, Jesus, you don't want them. Jesus said, yes, I do. Satan said, why, they're no count. They'll break your heart. They'll trample their feet in your black blood. Jesus said, I know every one of them. I know them better than you do. I want to buy them. He said, what will you take? Satan says, you, you, you tell me what you'll give. Jesus said, I'll give you all the silver in the world. Satan said, it's not enough. Jesus said, I'll give you all the gold in the world. Pile it on top of the silver. Satan said, it's not enough. Jesus said, I'll give you all of the precious stones in the world. Pile it on top of the gold and the silver. Satan said, it's not enough. Jesus said, what's your price? Name it. Satan said, you won't pay it. Jesus said, I will. Satan said, these sinners will cost you the silver of your tears and the gold of your blood. Jesus said, I'll pay it. And Satan said, here's the cage. I'll collect when I'm ready. And Jesus took the cage. He sent his prophets and they stoned them. He gave his law, and they broke it. He sent pestilences, and they ignored them. And one day he came and said, One day in Gethsemane, his garden, I wasn't present there, but the Holy Spirit was, and he told us about it in here. My Lord was there facing the cross, and I don't know what happened, but the agony was such that his sweat became blood. And he cried out, if it be possible. And he looked up, and there was Satan standing over his shoulder, and he said, can't you leave me alone? And Satan said, I've come to collect. Tomorrow you'll pay with the silver of your tears and the gold of your blood. And the next day, amid the jeers of the mob, 
Amid the echo of the most lawless cry this world ever heard, away with him, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. The Lord Jesus Christ paid redemption price to set sinners free. But that is all that happened. When he paid the price, he unlocked the chain. And from that hour to that, thank God, men and women, boys and girls, as they've heard the gospel proclamation, fly out, sinner, fly out in the name and in the power of the blood of Christ. Come out of the cage, he's unlocked the door, have freedom. Thank God, men and women have done it until from that hour to this. There's never been a second of time when somebody had been flying away from Satan toward God, saying, Redeem, redeem, redeem. Thank God. Praise the Lord. If America goes into the camp of communism, and I think she will, thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. If it's more lawless tomorrow than it is today, I don't see how it can be. And God, Jesus did die. And that soul that on Jesus shall lean for repose, he'll never, no, never forsake to his foes. Praise God for the blood of Christ. Yes, since I was in Yellowstone National Park on a little vacation, and when you go into the park there in Wyoming, they give you a book of instructions so you won't miss any of the things in the park. Take you several weeks, I guess, to go through it all. And I was intrigued by what it said about the handkerchief pool. And I finally made my way to a little pool of water about as big, about half as big, or two-thirds as big as this platform. They call it the handkerchief pool, for ever since white men have known about it, everybody that goes there uh, does the same thing. You take a handkerchief or a dirty rag, and I took an old greasy handkerchief I'd used cleaning spark plug in my old T-Model 4, and I held it like this, and it's artesian geyser water. Like hundreds of feet down, just boiling up. And I just let that handkerchief tip the water and then let the pull of the water pull it down till it burned my finger. And then I pulled it up right quick. And that old greasy, dirty, black handkerchief was as white as snow. And that's the reason they call it the handkerchief pool. You let something, some piece of rag that's filth and dirty, and that water in a second will wash all the dirt away. And without being conscious of it, I stood there and began to sing, There is a fountain filled with blood, Sing it Rejoice to see that fountain in his day. Boy, if you hadn't come to where that's a matter of rejoicing you, I hope you will. Just on the Spirit's testimony, state your eternal destiny. This book is true and set your seal to it. 
come to the place where you can say, my only hope, my only plea. Christ Jesus died, and he died for me. I can't do that for you. I can't do that for you. That's, that's you. Huh? Oh, yes. He rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there, I didn't say me, there have I. I believe I have, too. There have I. No vile is he. Oh, praise God. I believe America's Amen. gone, brother. I believe the communists are going to take us lock, stock, and barrel. I don't believe that people can do God like people in America That's in right, the church brother. out and get virus. That's right. I read the record of history, the gospel's planted, it's embraced, it's perverted, it's despised, and it's taken away. But I don't give a hoot whether America goes communist or not. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus, nothing my absence. I'm not going to hang around here forever anyhow. I'm not trying to save civilization. Christ didn't come to civilize this world. He came to save believing sinners. The dear dying lamb. He rejoiced about it. Amen. Oh, the devil's trying to kill God's people now. This is the bluest, most perplexed, troubled generation of God's people this world ever saw. We got 40 problems for every solution. You, if you would, you would quit lying to me. Just admit it, brother. This is trouble. Eh? Satan's attacking, and he wear your body down. He wear your soul down. God knows once in a while. I like to go to the Book of Revelation, and I read about the precious blood of Christ and a lot of folks who washed their robes in them and made them clean. And I just dipped my hands in that blood and stained my old tired brain and my old aching body these last months. And I said, oh, God, I'm going to wash my soul again in the blood of Christ. And I'd get up and say, come on, devil, I'll lick the hell out of you again if you fool with me. Oh, this power in the blood. We can defeat the devil and we can drive away his despair. There have I, as old vile as he. I believe it. Washed all my sins away. And before I got started on the third verse, somebody tapped my shoulder. And I was unconscious. I didn't know a thing in that. Wasn't put on. And I expect there's a hundred people gathered there. They're there from everywhere in America, you know, vacation time. And they were standing there. And they said, could we sing with you? And so there in Yellowstone National Park, people there from every state, I guess. We sang what I think is the greatest verse of song, what I think, that's ever written. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the rats of the church of God to save to sin no more. you believe that? Thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the rest of the church of God be persuade you. I enjoin you. I exhort you. Don't you live through this life without facing the most stupendous fact of history. Jesus Christ, God's Son, died. You better find out who he is. You better find out why he died. You better find out what it accomplished. I can't find it out for you. I can't do business with God for you. 
I could be wrong myself. But you can't help me there. You don't know whether I'm saved or not. You don't you can't see inside. Huh? You can't see inside. Let's bow your head. Go home if you're not saved. And start seeking God. Brother, you don't need a little decision. You need God. You don't need just a profession. You need to meet Christ. Is that right? God bless you. That's my invitation. I don't believe you'll ever get saved. You and God get alone. Maybe be a thousand people standing around. But you and God don't have to get alone on that day. <coughs> As long as you deal with me, I can't save you. You're going to have to do business with God. Is that all right, brother? That's true. All right. Now let's bow our heads. Beginning tomorrow night, I'm going to stand on what I preach tonight, warm sinner. If what I preach tonight is so, God bless your heart. God has ransacked heaven for sinful men. And I'm going to call morning if God will let us live. Your pastor this morning and tonight gave the key. I need not add anything to it. I'm here as your guest. I want to see God become the Savior of many women. You do too, don't you? Brother Don, will you dismiss us in the word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ came into this world. He was crucified, buried, and raised again the third day. And today, this moment, he sits at the right hand of the throne of the universe, with all authority and power in his hand. And the same Lord stood yonder somewhere around the Sea of Galilee and told his disciples that he'd go back and send the Holy Spirit. And when he has come, he has convicted the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And he asked, we ask tonight in his name, yes, that is the uh, series of services progresses this week. That he, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the thrice holy God, will come and convict hearts of their lost, rebellious, undone, hell-bound condition and prostrate before the God of creation, they'll cry for mercy. And there, because of the atoning work of the Son of God on Calvary, God has promised to forgive everyone that called upon the thing. And praise God for his own life, and he'll do that very thing. And we'll be careful to praise your name, Father, because it's in Christ's name we ask you for his glory. Amen. 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 It's wonderful. There's nobody else well, ever Praise God. From whom all is Rob Barnett. I know, Brother God, I've been quite full. I was there. But it happened.